Welcome to today's virtual digital economy seminar. It is great to see so many of you after this little three week break. Um, as I will play the role of moderator today, let me be very brief with the formalities. Um, if you have clarification questions, please send these to me in the chat window and I will unmute you so you can ask the question directly to the speaker. We'll do the same to collect questions for the Q&A after the talk. And uh, as always, this session will be recorded and made available on YouTube. So if you do ask a question yourself during the talk, you will also appear in the recording. Let me also be very brief with introducing our speaker today. Matthew Genskel is another speaker who needs very little introduction. He's a professor of economics at Stanford University. And uh, he has worked extensively on the media and their role for political outcomes and social welfare with a recent focus on polarization. So uh, in the paper we'll present today, we will see the connection of this issue to one of the most pressing current issues, namely the containment uh, of the COVID-19 crisis. I have been very much looking forward to this. Matthew, you have 45 minutes and the floor is open. All right. Well, thank you so much, Hannes. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. It's great to get a chance to talk to you. This is joint work with Hunt Alcott from NYU Levi Boxell, Jacob Conway, who are PhD students at Stanford, David Yang, who's an assistant professor at Harvard, and Michael Thaler, who's a PhD student at Harvard. And I think, you know, I guess to, to just set up where we were coming from in, in thinking about this paper, we've been, I've been thinking about polarization for a long time. Many of us have been talking about polarization for a long time in the US, in Europe, in other parts of the world. And one of the things that people have said again and again is, uh, you know, in talking about the costs and the risks associated with, with political polarization and deep political divisions is, you know, whatever we think those costs are in normal times, the real issue may be what happens when we have to face a real national crisis Something like, you know, if we had to fight World War II again, or if we uh, faced a moment where the stakes are really high in that way, the ability of, of countries, of people to come together and unite around common goals, obviously is essential in those kinds of situations. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, here we are. This is one of the biggest crises that we've seen in a very long time. And, and I think actually it's a, a crisis of a form about public health emergencies like this are a, a kind of crisis where it's especially central for people to be able to uh, have clear communication, clear messaging, clear information, for people to have accurate beliefs, uh, for people to, to all be kind of on the same page about what's happening, what are the facts, what do we need to do? And so if we thought that we might see the dangers of all of the different things that have happened that, that, that make getting on that same page harder, this might be a moment where we really see that playing out. So that was kind of the broad motivation for thinking of about looking at political differences and the role that they're playing in the US in the response to this crisis. So many people have, have made this point. Um, this was a, a paper from the Carnegie Endowment for Peace where they're saying this is subjecting countries around the world to a real test of solidarity. And there's a real question as to what's gonna happen, to what, which countries, to what extent are countries going to be able to pull together? And are we gonna be, the leaders gonna step up and uh, unite countries in the way that's necessary to respond to this emergency effectively, or instead, is this something that's going to widen or deepen the divisions that are already there? Um, and this headline from the Washington Post, I think, captures it succinctly that the, as, as, as will actually be clear in the results of this paper and, and clear as soon as you think about it a little bit, this is a situation where the stakes are really high and where differences in, in people's responses can translate directly into lives lost. 
Um, prior to us writing this paper, there was already kind of survey evidence in the US suggesting that this concern might be real, that there might be a, a, a partisan division opening up in, that, would, that would then shape how we respond to this crisis. Um, this is just survey evidence from January through March. Um, on the left is people's response to the question, just how concerned are you about the coronavirus? Um, and on the right is people's self-reported social distancing behaviors of various kinds or self-reported responses. And you can already see there was a pattern where uh, Republicans reported being less worried and doing less social distancing. Um, I, I think it's worth noting here that, you know, unlike some things, it, it, it's not even obvious how this crisis and the, the question, is coronavirus a big threat or a small threat? Uh, or should we be doing something about it? That, that aligns in any way with the normal political divisions between left and right. I don't, I don't think it would, it would have been obvious, or at least wouldn't have been obvious to me if you'd asked me ahead of time, uh, you know, which party is going to be on the side of um, just in general is, or left-wing parties or right-wing parties going to be more on the side of this is a big threat. It's not, not obvious at all, but I think it, it's very clear the way things have played out in the U.S., I, I think largely because the president has responded in part with a big stake early on in trying to avoid economic costs from the pandemic. And one way or another, the messaging from the administration has been very much on the side of, you know, this is not a big deal. We shouldn't worry about it so much. So I think, you know, one, it may be that you could replay history another time with a different president in power in this country and have these differences reversed. Um, but one way or another, this is the way things have played out. And so we see this backdrop of, of at least on surveys, some sense of um, partisan division. I, I think I, I really want to emphasize at the same time, um, we can look at the direction of these differences, but I also want you to look at the magnitude of these differences. And, you know, if you look at this plot on the left, yes, Republicans are less concerned, but by the end of March, that's the difference between you know, 93% of Democrats being concerned and 90% of Republicans being concerned. And so a, a theme I really want to hang on to here is uh, we need to be thinking both about the direction and the magnitude of these differences. And I, 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 I think saying, as we will end up saying at the end of the day, that these partisan divisions are real and are clear and are affecting people's behavior and do have consequences in terms of lives lost should not be misinterpreted to mean these divisions are bigger than they really are. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other survey evidence you can point to or, or even kind of framing the same survey evidence differently to say, well, in another sense, maybe this is a, a time where the United States is pulling together. Um, you know, 80 to 90 percent of People on both sides support social distancing rules. 90% of Americans think we need shelter in place orders and so on to avoid a second wave of the pandemic. 90% of both Democrats and Republicans support the economic aid packages that were passed. 90% support increased testing. 80% support the president's policy to temporarily halt immigration from other countries. Um, and so, we have two sides of the coin. There are partisan divisions, but yet at the same time, they're not as big as some might think. And to a substantial extent, the, there is a lot of common acceptance of the severity of this crisis and the need to do something about it. Okay, so this is a, this is a short paper. It's um, a simple paper. We don't do anything very fancy here, and we don't have any, you know, brilliant causal identification in this paper. We just wanted to do essentially three things. Um, so if you, if you started from those survey results, um, there are a few questions you might ask. The, 
in just wondering how real are these partisan differences? The first thing you might ask is, well, these are just self-reports on surveys. How, to what extent does that really show up in people's actual behavior? It might be, it's really easy to say on a survey, if there's a sense of partisan division around this thing, it might be really easy to say on a survey, ah, yeah, yeah, I don't, I haven't changed my behavior at all. I'm still going out and going to restaurants and shaking people's hands and whatever. But when it actually comes to doing it, when your own health is on the line and the stakes are real, maybe people's actual behavior would not um, show up as much. And maybe some of what we hear on surveys is just like partisan cheerleading of, of some form. So the first goal is to use real data to look at real social distancing behavior. And so like a lot of other work in the last couple of months um, looking at this crisis, we're gonna use GPS data from cell phones to look at partisan differences in social distancing. Second thing you might've worried about with the survey evidence is, well, sure, maybe there is more social distancing among Democrats than among Republicans in the US, but that could be entirely because of the fact that all of the areas in the US that are hardest hit by the virus are democratic leaning areas. And so the Democrats live in New York City, they live in Washington State, they live in New Jersey, um, they live in cities. Cities are where the crisis has been worst, where the actual threat of the virus has been biggest. And so maybe all we're seeing here is th those survey gaps just are artifacts of differences in how hard hit different places have been, the differences in policies that people are living under as a result, differences in um, other demographics that are not just party and so on. So we don't have a great instrument for partisanship here, but we're just going to try to as much as we can see what happens if we control flexibly for those other factors and try to separate out the partisan effect. Um, and then the final little thing we do in this paper is uh, we have a survey that we did um, kind of at the beginning of April where we, um, you know, to some extent repeated some of these other survey questions that had been asked, but, but in particular, we asked people to make forecasts of how many cases they thought there would be in the month of April, how severe they thought the virus would turn out to be. Um, and we also gave people incentives for accuracy ex post on those predictions. So that, that gives us, I think, a, a slightly better measure than was available before of to what extent are there actual differences in beliefs about the severity of the crisis. There could be lots of other reasons why social distancing behavior differs by party, um, even if everybody has the same beliefs about what's happening and, uh, and, and the future path of the virus. And so we wanted to, to isolate those differences in beliefs. And the bottom line, which you'll see pretty soon, is I think these partisan gaps that we're talking about are in fact real and are significant and are economically meaningful in magnitude, but they're also not enormous. And um, so we're gonna kind of keep this two sides of the coin theme running. And I, I think some people might walk away from a paper like this with the impression that if you go to kind of red state Republican parts of the US, you would see a totally different world where everybody's out having barbecues in the park and like shaking hands with each other and going to parties at their friends' houses and um, so on, out in the street, going to stores. And that's really not the reality. The reality is the first order thing is there has been an enormous amount of social distancing everywhere in the US. That was true even before lockdown orders were in place. So there was a huge amount of voluntary social distancing everywhere in the US. And the magnitude of that is different by party, but not so, so different. Okay. Um, so let me walk through then a few, a few pieces of, of what we did. So we actually have a little model in the paper. Um, I'm not even gonna show you the notation for that because it's, it's, it's very simple and it's really just designed to make a, a point which I think is intuitive. So that model just kind of glues together a standard epidemiological model with a uh, choice model of utility maximizing agents who are deciding s some activity level variable, which is like, how much do I decide to go out and about 
um, how much do I decide to, 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 to go to stores to keep doing things or do I do social distancing? Um, and I, I think what we wanted to capture with that model and emphasize with that model is just, there are a lot of reasons why in an efficient world, in, a, in an optimal world, different people would do different amounts of social distancing. And there are plenty of reasons why those factors that would lead people to efficiently do different amounts of social distancing could differ between Democrats and Republicans. And we should not jump to the conclusion that if we see, say, Democrats doing more social distancing than Republicans, that the Democrats are right and the Republicans are wrong, or that um, either of them actually is making a mistake. So in that model, we have a few different factors at play. So from an individual's perspective in that model, they are trading off some reduced form utility loss from social distancing, which could be like the lost wages if you don't go to work, which could be the cost of not being able to go out and go shopping. It could be the fact that you don't don't get to hang out with your friends against their individual risk of infection if they do go out and about. And so that's the individual choice is, is the loss to me from staying home versus the risk to me of catching the virus if I go out. Um, and then obviously there are important externalities as well in this setting. <clears throat> and so in the model, we capture those in, in a kind of reduced form way as externalities that could capture both the, the risk that I pose to others if I go out and get infected, because if I go out and infected, get infected, I'm then likely to spread the virus to more people, and also possibly economic impacts that could go the other way. It could be that there are actually some positive pecuniary externalities to me going out and like, you know, getting food from restaurants and keeping the restaurants alive and keeping the, the, the economy going. So those are the trade-offs in the model and the conclusions um, as I said, are basically, as you can see, there are all both the cost that people face from staying home and their actual infection risk and their externalities could all be different across different people, could be different in ways that are correlated with party. But what we also show in the model is if it were the case that there are partisan differences which are driven not by different marginal benefits and marginal costs, but by differences in beliefs. So if so, there's like a belief term in the model, how bad do you think the virus is? How big do you think the infection risk is? If that is heterogeneous, and there's one group of people who thinks that risk is high, another group of people who thinks that risk is low, then that is inefficient. And inefficient in the sense, we don't know which of them is, is doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Maybe they're both doing the wrong thing, but we could improve welfare by having the people who are doing less social distancing do a bit more and having the people who are do, doing more social distancing do a bit less. Okay. In the empirical part of this, then we're going to use GPS data from the company SafeGraph, which I think nobody had heard of aside from a few economists and other people prior to this crisis, but a lot of you probably have heard about since because they've made these data publicly available and they've been used for a lot of research uh, looking at the crisis. The, their whole, you know, all this GPS data, you should know in the background, it, it's a kind of shady business the way this is collected. And, um, you know, how do they, how do they get all of this data? They have like, 45 million devices in their panel. They see all of their pings. Um, how do they do that? Well, the, w the way they do that is there are lots and lots of app developers who, who put apps, you, you put their apps on their phone, their apps collect location data if you let them. And those app developers resell that data to third parties. Um, you know, incidentally, I think the market for this is not about individual level data. So you could like follow people and figure out what they're doing. The market for this is stuff like hedge funds that want to buy data on how many people are going to different stores um, in real time. But uh, that's that's where it originates. And so you should have in somewhere in the back of your mind the idea that there are real sample selection issues associated with these panels. They're not a random sample of people. They're they're a kind of convenience sample based on people who have whatever that mysterious set of apps is on their phones and allow them to collect location data. Okay. Um, and then the, 
we don't use here the micro data. We're using aggregated data. And the form of that aggregated data is is basically counts of visits to specific what Sifgraph calls points of interest, which are they're not like tourist attractions. That's basically every place that that they can identify on a map as being something. So a retail establishment, a park, a hospital, um, a beach, you know, anywhere that that has uh, meaning on a map. Combine it with some census data on demographics and presidential. 2016 election data to pick up partisanship. And then we have this survey that we did at the beginning of April, which included 2000 people from the US that we balanced as best we could on basic demographics. Okay. Um, so here is what these differences look like in the raw data. Um, if we just look at the raw GPS data, not controlling for anything. So just in the raw data, you can see the two things that I said, which are there was a huge amount of social distancing everywhere. That was um, largely took place before there were any lockdown orders in place. So March 15th in the US is when um, like a bunch of things happened right here, including Trump declaring this a national emergency, um, including, you know, a bunch of basketball players getting infected in the NBA, canceling games, including all the universities sending people home. So this was sort of a big week when a lot of things happened. There was a huge decline in movement in that week. And most of the shelter in place orders happened later over here. Um, and I'll come back and talk about this uh, at the end, think about some some like ongoing work that we're doing. But so you can see that big social distancing, and you can also see the partisan gap. And you can think about, you know, this gives you a good sense of the relative magnitude of those things. Um, here's another way to, to, to look at the same thing. So on the left is a map colored by the extent of social distancing as measured by the change in GPS data visits from, you know, before to after in that graph that I, in the, in the plot that I was just showing you. Um, and red areas here are areas where people are doing less social distancing, where movement changed less, and blue areas are those where it changed more. And on the right is the 2016 presidential election map from the U.S. Red areas are Republican, blue areas are Democratic. And so you can just see, looking at the map, that there's a lot of correlation between these things. It's not perfect, but... Um, you know, the coastal parts of the U.S., which tend to vote Democratic, and the big cities in the U.S. that tend to vote Democratic are also the places where social distancing has been greatest. Now, we can also look at the health data. And just to make the point that I said at the beginning, that, that there are big differences in the severity of the epidemic across these places, this is counts of... Uh, COVID cases and deaths attributed to COVID in Democratic and Republican counties in the US. This is actually excluding New York City uh, because New York City accounts for a really large share of cases and deaths and, and would kind of dominate a figure like this. So even excluding New York City, you can see there's just an overwhelming difference in the extent to which um, Democratic and Republican areas have been affected by the, by the virus. Um, and so just if you if you live in a Republican place, this is a very different thing in terms of the personal risk that you've faced. And so we might very naturally think that all of the partisan differences are explained by this difference in, in severity. So Matthew? Yep. Um, so Peter Moser is asking whether you've controlled for urbanization. Uh, she lost connection earlier. I'm not sure that you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, not yet, but very soon. So, okay. so you know, the again, like the empirical work in this paper is going to be like run a regression with a bunch of controls. And we're going to do that in a second. Right now, I'm just showing you the raw, um, the raw data. But here, in, in terms of, you know, we're going to be focused on... Um, mostly here looking at differences in social distancing with controls in terms of the the case counts and deaths this difference is totally about urbanization and density i mean i think the um 
to, to a large degree, the reason why Democratic counties have been harder hit is because those are the cities. Um, it's also, they're also the places that have the most inbound, um, you know, flights and movement from outside the U.S., from places like Italy and China that were affected early. Okay, so, so that's one confound that you would want to keep an eye on. Um, this is another, which is, you know, in, in our great U.S. tradition of doing everything in a decentralized way, um, all of the social distancing policies in the U.S. have been enacted initially at the local level, county level, and then later at the state level. Um, and so, you know, this map shows the, the date at which stay-at-home orders, shelter-in-place orders were enacted, and you can see there's a lot of variation. There are places that by the end of the sample we're looking at in this paper still had no stay at home order. Those are the places in this kind of orangish red color um, and places that had stay at home orders as early as the 12th of March. Um, and so again, you know, this map is also pretty correlated with the social distancing map. So another factor driving this could be just the timing of the policies and maybe that maybe the partisan gap is about that as well. So our, uh, you know, super sophisticated empirical strategy here is going to be to regress the log of visits on uh, at the county level. So the data is we, we aggregate up to county by week and basically count this number of visits in that county during that week. So this is like people visiting some locations outside of their homes in that county. Um, take a log of that and regress it on county fixed effects. And then Republican vote share with coefficients that vary by week, as well as interaction of a bunch of controls also with flexible coefficients that vary each week. So those are state by week fixed effects health controls for log cases, log number of COVID cases, log number of COVID deaths, um, interacted flexibly with weak stay at home orders, and then a bunch of demographics, including especially population density. And we can also put in like percent urban and other measures of whether you're in a city, age, race, education, income, poverty, public transportation measures, some course measures of occupation distribution. So another thing that you could think would really affect how much people are staying at home is what kind of jobs they're doing and how much scope they have to stay at home. Um, weather, uh, and that's a typo. It should not say MUI county fixed effects. Um, and we're gonna cluster standard errors in this by state. So this is then plotting the coefficients on Republican share. So this partisan difference is the coefficient on Republican where higher numbers here mean, um, remember the outcome is how many visits there are, how much people are moving around. So positive numbers here mean Republicans are moving around more, i.e. Republicans are social distancing less. This is the raw gap with no controls, just the county fixed effects and weak fixed effects. Um, and you see a clearly significant and quite large difference opening up in beginning in early March. Um, the, this, is all, this is all in logs. So just to think about what the scale means, 0.8 here means roughly if you took the difference between 100% Democratic county and 100% Republican county, this would imply that the 100% Republican county has about 80% more movement. Now, of course, there are no 0% or 100% Republican counties in the US. So that's way outside the support of the data. But that's that's kind of the magnitudes here. Um, and this is what you get once you've included all of the controls um, that we're talking about. And you see that gap shrinks by quite a lot, um, but still remains quite significant. We show in, in the appendix, if you want to look, there's there are like a whole bunch of plots of this um, with various sets of these controls and subsets of these controls and including some and including others. And I think roughly what you see is, you know, that there are a few key things like the population density controls 
um, which are really important here. And then once you've included that core set of things, the results are pretty robust. The magnitudes are actually pretty stable depending on which other controls are included. So, you know, we don't, we can't rule out the fact, the possibility that there's other stuff we're not controlling for here, but it doesn't look like something where just the more controls you include, the closer this gets to zero. I think what it really says is obviously how many cases of COVID there are is related to social distancing. And we just saw that it's related to party. It's obviously really related to uh, whether you live in a big city. It's obviously related to whether there's a law where you live saying you're not allowed to go out of your house. So all of those factors are, are clearly pushing this coefficient up in the raw data. Um, you know, and so this, you could, you could read this very roughly to say two thirds or so of the raw gap is due to those other things. Whereas one third of it um, might be due actually to the, to the impact of party. So, so what does this mean for magnitude? You know, again, zero to one on the right-hand side variable is, is way outside the support of the data. Um, but if we go from inside the support of the data, go from a county at the 10th percentile of the Republican vote share distribution to the 90th percentile, that implies about a 14% difference in how much people are moving around. So if you took a, a 10th percentile county and made it a 90th percentile county, you'd see 14% more um, visits to these locations in April and May. Um, another way to say that is this, that move from 10th to 90th would account for about 16% of the total drop in visits from January 26th to May 3rd. So we would, you would get about 16% less social distancing um, if you move from 10 to 90. So, you know, this is, this is where I, I, I say, this looks to me like big enough to matter. And I think if we, if we were to kind of feed this through the SIR model, it would imply a, a, a meaningful and important number of excess deaths associated with that 14% higher uh, movement. But it's also moderate in size and not as big as some people might be walking around thinking. Um, okay. So we can then do a bunch of other stuff to try to uh, evaluate this. This is just showing you the breakdown by different kinds of locations. You see, you know, things look pretty similar, whether you look at, at like restaurants, retail, entertainment locations. Um, in contrast, if you look at healthcare locations like hospitals, there's not much of a partisan gap. So there doesn't seem to be a big difference in, in how much people are going to hospitals. This is the daily version of that plot, just to show. Um, <clears throat> you can see, you know, the timing a little more sharply there. You can also see there does seem to be a, a, a pattern that opens up by April where these partisan gaps are bigger on week ends than on weekdays. So I think that would be consistent with a lot of the discretionary stuff that people are doing. Um, that that does vary by party being related to, to kind of weekend activities, um, going out to the beach or so on. Um, we can we can also do a version of this. So remember, everything I just showed you is like county by week data. Um, the the raw GPS data is at a pretty fine level of aggregation. So we've also experimented with doing a version of this analysis at a smaller level, which is electoral precincts, uh, which, is, which is basically like the smallest level of geography at which voting data is measured. A precinct is a polling location and the area that from which everybody votes in a given polling location. So that's, you know, smaller than a county. It's smaller than a zip code. It's a, it's a pretty small, you know, it's something like a, a, a group of census blocks. Um, so we can look at things at that level. In principle, we can do that then including county by week fixed effects. So we can look only at variation within counties to the Republican and Democratic areas within a given county do different, um, do people from those areas do different amounts of social distancing. This comes with some big caveats because we actually don't have a perfect mapping from the geographic units at which we observe the safe graph data 
to these precincts, which is the geographic unit at which we observe the election data. So, it, you know, you want to think about a bunch of these little cells, which are precincts, and then a map with a bunch of other little cells, which are what the GPS data are measured in. And the overlap is pretty imperfect. Um, and so we do that mapping as best we can, but, but it means there's a lot of measurement error um, in, you know, basically that boils down to um, there's a, a lot of measurement error in the way we're mapping um, the vote share of the precincts to uh, the movement data that we see. Okay, so caveats, nevertheless, we can do it. And this is what we see. We can do it two different ways. I should have said um, one is just analogous to the way that we did the county analysis to look at how many visits were there to locations in this precinct. Um, the other is to say, which I think is maybe a little closer to what you would really want, uh, of devices that we infer or that SafeGraph infers live in this precinct, how many visits did they make to locations out and about, which, which might not have been in this precinct. Um, so, you know, that's closer to a measure of, of social distancing, You're saying people who live in this very Republican little precinct, how much are they going out and about? The downside of that is it adds another element of measurement error because it, it relies a lot then on the exact inference of these home locations, which can be somewhat noisy. Um, anyway, so this is what you see for, for the first one. That's just the visits. This is what you see for the second one, which is stops away from home. Um, so, you know, these are both smaller and less significant here. We only see significant partisan differences by end of April, early May, although they're, you know, they're opening up um, over time. So I think, I think those, we include those results in the appendix. I think they're, uh, it's a good kind of thing to keep in mind. In some sense, this is stronger if you were worried about omitted variables that are, this county specification is still not capturing. But on the other hand, um, it does come with a lot of measurement error and so on. Uh, we can do a placebo version of this looking at 2019 and there's no, as you would hope, there we don't see similar patterns in 2019. So this isn't just some seasonal thing. Um, and then we do a bunch of robustness checks, including, uh, as I said, more and fewer controls, different measures. Um, maybe most importantly, just to keep in mind, we can also do everything excluding cities, excluding large cities. Um, and results look quite similar. So, you know, there are, there are a number of omitted variables kind of stories that one could tell that are related specifically to New York and LA and Seattle and San Francisco and so on. Even if you exclude those, so you're really just looking at, at either smaller cities or suburban areas, um, you see similar things. And we can also drop the entire states of California, Washington, and New York. Those are states that had particular early histories that are a bit different um, and things still look the same. So just turning then quickly to the, to the survey data, um, you, you know, so what would you make of what I've shown you so far? Suppose you believe it, um, that it's actually a partisan gap. What could that be coming from? It'd be coming from a bunch of things. One of them is differences in beliefs. And as we said, in the context of the model, that's the thing that really has the clearest implication of inefficiency from a welfare point of view. It could be due to other things. It could be due to differences in, in the way businesses responded and how many stores are closed versus open in these different areas. It could be due to differences in messaging by local leaders and state leaders that are not captured in the stay at home order variables that we have. Um, there could be some omitted variables still. Um, but so, so a big question I think is how much can we attribute this to differences in beliefs? We can't, we don't have any way to to show you what share of this effect is due to that, but this survey is gonna give us a little more resolution on the belief differences. So we asked people, these 2000 people in the survey, um, self reports of how much social distancing they're doing. We asked them a question about what do you think is more important as a way to kind of help the country? Should you be staying home to prevent the spread of the virus or should you be going out and supporting local restaurants to boost the economy? Um, we asked people a question about how effective is social distancing. So do you actually think it'll make a difference to whether you get the virus, whether you do social distancing or not? 
And then the main one we want to focus on, we asked this sort of quantitative question about how many cases do you think there will be in the US in April? And we asked that question without, with and without um, incentives for accuracy. So in, in the incentive treatment, people were paid up to $100, depending on how close their prediction was to the actual case count in April. And so these are those results. Um, so this is coefficients on um, your reported affiliation with the Republican versus Democratic Party. Negative numbers here mean that Democrats do more self-reported social distancing. Democrats think it's more important to do social distancing relative to helping the economy. Democrats think doing social distancing will be more effective. Democrats predict more cases in April. All of that is very similar if we do it without controls or we do it with all of the controls that I told you about that we used in the main GPS analysis. We can also do it with county fixed effects. There's actually enough um, within county variation in this, even though we only have 2000 people that you get similar results if you just look at different people who are Republican and Democrat who live in the same county. And then interestingly, it looks pretty similar. If anything, the partisan gap gets a bit bigger once we pay people um, for accuracy. And you can see that this is um, it's kind of zooming in a little bit more on this um, incentive treatment. And so you see, if anything here, the, the partisan gap in predicted cases is getting bigger under incentives. We also asked a separate question about what do you predict will be Trump's disapproval rating, his approval rating um, at the end of April? So this was another prediction question that was designed to be a more kind of um, obviously partisan thing. And the reason we put that in there is because th there is prior work, this paper by Bullock et al., this paper by Marcus Pryor and co-authors, um, showing that in general on surveys, if you take factual questions which have a clear partisan tilt, the the partisan gaps on those questions tend to shrink when you provide incentives. And those authors' interpretation of that is that, that the incentives, um, that without the incentives, part of what you're getting is this kind of partisan cheerleading. So if I ask you, what do you think will be Trump's approval rating? If you're very pro-Trump, you say, it's going to be great. And if you are very anti-Trump, you say, it's going to be terrible. That might not necessarily reflect your actual belief your, your factual belief about what's going to happen. And if we said, okay, now you're going to earn a million dollars if you get it right, you might slow down and think about it a little bit more and say, okay, actually, yeah, it's probably, his approval rate is probably not going to be that high. Um, and so you see that with the disapproval question, but you don't see it with the predicted cases question. And I think that's um, interesting. That to us points toward these differences in beliefs about the severity of the epidemic being in some sense, real beliefs. People genuinely at this point in time had different beliefs about how severe this epidemic was gonna be. It isn't just like a partisan cheerleading response where, well, Trump said it's gonna be great. So I'm gonna say that on the survey, okay? So to conclude, as I said, this gap is significant. It remains significant after controlling for stuff. We, we kick the tires as much as we're able to in this data. And I think, I think um, it, it seems pretty clear to us that the right inference is there are real partisan differences in how much social distancing people are doing. That goes along with real differences in beliefs. At the same time, there's the flip side of this coin, which is the, the magnitude of those gaps is moderate. It's big enough to matter. It's big enough that it has real consequences for, for lives and for the course of the epidemic in the U.S. But it's small enough that um, if you go to Red America or you go to Blue America, the first order thing is you're going to see the same thing, which is that everybody is worried. Everybody thinks this is serious. Everybody to a first approximation is staying home voluntarily, even before there are these stay at home orders. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you in time. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, let me start with, uh, so Jonathan Hurt has two. Uh, the first one was, uh, how does consumption of partisan media impact this? So, OANN, Fox News. 
Um, and the second would be uh, does unemployment support affect this as well? Unemployment support in the sense of like unemployment insurance or the provision of I unemployment benefits. Those individuals are on unemployment support. Um, but yeah. Yeah, if you wanna... yeah. So, so I mean, the 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 media question is a great one. Um, you know, in terms of motivation for this, and in terms of our priors coming in, there are basically two big reasons to think there might be partisan gaps that are really about party. One is what the president and and other politicians have been saying, and the other is what partisan media have been saying. And it's very clear um, in the U.S. Wow, I'm tempted. How much time do we have? Uh, 14 minutes. We're good on time. Okay, okay. I'm not gonna, well, I'm not gonna take time to show it to you, although it's awfully fun. Um, but if, if, if you go search for like Daily Show, COVID, Jonathan, Fox Jonathan, News, Jonathan there, wants to see it. what? Jonathan wants to see it. Oh, okay, hold on. Um, so this comes with a disclaimer. This is not a fair and balanced portrayal of how Fox News covered the coronavirus. This is um, a comedy television show's montage. Uh, but with that caveat, here's what you would have seen if you were watching Fox News. Also, Srila Murti, he was uh, giving a, a note here that there's a paper by Dubey et al. Uh, who yeah, gonna... I'm going to mention that. Yeah. So I'll come back and and talk about their paper in just a sec. But this. Uh, OK, just for fun. Everybody can see this, yeah? I can see it. So it should be on. Yeah. Mm, wait a second, I'm going to hold on. Yes, impressive. Okay, so, so if you were watching Fox News, um, that's what you saw. And so so I think I think absolutely that, like, both what politicians are saying and what people were seeing on the media could play a big role. Um, as uh, I think you said, somebody in the chat mentioned, so Andre Simonov and JP Dubay and co-authors um, have a great paper where they're trying to zero in on that media part more precisely. We can't do that. We don't do that in our paper, but they use um, Greg Martin and Ali Urakoglu's channel position instrument, which is like instrument for how much people watch Fox News based on some idiosyncrasies in where it shows up in the channel lineup on different cable systems to get something closer to quasi random variation in who's watching Fox News. And, and that analysis suggests, indeed, if you kind of randomly assign people to watch more Fox News, they ended up social distancing less. Okay. Um, so, and I don't know about unemployment insurance and, and unemployment benefits. I, I think um, it's a good question. Those policies mostly vary at, in the U.S. at the state level. Um, they're, they're not, you know, they, there's federal unemployment insurance. And then to the extent that there's other variation, it's at the state level. So you can think about all of our analysis. We have state by week fixed effects. Everything is within state. So in a sense, you can think of those fixed effects as, as controlling for that policy variation. So great. So you also answered the question by Jacques Remier, uh, uh directly uh, with that. That was good. Um, there's another one by Tim Gries. So I will unmute him so he can ask you yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the really interesting presentation. Uh, and my question directly uh, relates to the one you we just discussed or you discussed. 
And I was wondering about the differences of, of democratic and or, uh, deceased and uh, infected people um, between Democrats and Republicans and uh, whether you could kind of split uh, between uh, whether the beliefs are caused by differences in uh, public opinion as the media part uh, you just discussed and differences in private networks. So for example, how many more um, people who are infected um, are known by Democrats? Like uh, just as an example, as a Democrat, I might be more willing to, to follow the rules kind of if I know people who got infected already. So by controlling yeah, yeah. for ratio or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great question. I, I think so. We we don't do that. We don't have a way to do do that directly. I think at some point, studying those social network spillovers and in particular, you know, how do people's behavior change when they know somebody who actually is infected or actually dies, um, is a really interesting question. And, and my guess would be that effect is quite large. I don't think that plays a big role in in the estimates that I'm showing you just because for a lot of this period, especially, you know, during the month of March, um, the case counts in the US were still quite low. And so the probability of any given individual actually knowing, especially outside of the few cities that were hardest hit, the probability of somebody actually knowing anybody in their social network who was infected at that point is, is, is very, very small. So I think if we just did some bounding exercise thinking about um, the number of case counts and the probability of being connected to those people, it's unlikely that that has anything to do with with the effects that I'm showing you. But I think it's a super interesting thing to study more, particularly in the later period when um, in many places the, the case counts are a lot higher. Great, so I hope that answers the question, Tim. Um, there's another one by, and I'm going to read it out by Marco Schwartz. Um, he was wondering about heterogeneity of the partisan gap. So, uh, do old people feel for their lives, but uh, uh, younger people, um, they have they have the wrong beliefs, rather. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a great question. It's a, it's something actually we haven't done a lot on, and we could do more. Um, it's hard to do in the GPS data because. In the GBS data, we don't actually, we're not here using the, the micro device level data. And even if we had it, we don't have characteristics like age um, that we can attach to those devices. And if you did it at the county level, like looking at heterogeneity by the age distribution of the county, you're smudging most of the variation. Like there's not, there obviously aren't counties that are all old people and counties that are all young people. Um, but we could do it in the survey. And I, I think that would be looking at heterogeneity in the, in the, gap in social distancing response by age is interesting that's certainly like in the context of the little toy model we wrote down you know it's obvious that that those personal risk factors should matter a lot and um it might be you could think about models in which the impact of things like partisan beliefs are a lot bigger there's a lot more scope for those to matter if the personal risk you face is pretty small um, you know, that's sort of a version of the partisan cheerleading thing on the surveys, like stakes are low. So if it feels good to go out and like have a barbecue in the park in order to show everybody um, that, that you don't care about what the liberal media is saying, you're a lot more likely to do that if you don't think you actually face a risk of dying than if you do. Okay. Uh, great. So, so maybe, maybe I will close with a very uh, short uh, question. So I was wondering, you mentioned in the beginning about the safe graphs data. Uh, so have you thought a little bit about what kind of bias um, this could introduce? That is not a random sample. So is it rather individuals who are, who are more careless or less informed maybe that are using these apps which allow uh, more accurate tracking? Or I don't know, I, I don't know the data. But... Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. So we, I don't have a lot Honestly, to say, I think in terms of in terms of priors, you know, you you could imagine that. I think you could imagine that it it might tilt a sample a little bit toward lower income, lower education. How that interacts with the partisan gap, I have no idea. You know, because within Republican and Democrat, 
how, how might they be selected differently? I don't really have a clear prior. Um, I have another paper with Susan AC and Billy Ferguson um, that from a couple of years ago that uses the micro safe graph data to, to look at segregation patterns. And in that paper where we have the micro data, we do a bunch of work to look at the representativeness of the safe graph sample. And despite what I told you, it actually at, at a broad level of demographics looks reasonably representative. If you just, if you just look at the demographics of the places where these devices come from, you know, it's not perfectly uniform, but the, the selection is not enormous. So I don't think it's as bad as one might imagine, but I think it's an important caveat and, you know, I, it, it could matter in various directions. I don't have a clear prior on the partisan gap, which way it would go. Okay, great. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, close up for today. So we're exactly on time and uh, some people might wanna join the CPR um, uh, panel that's gonna start in a minute. And Christian will close out. So thank you very much, Matthew. It was a pleasure to, to see and hear you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for participating in today's seminar. Uh, we're looking forward to continue the White Seminar next week, June 18th. Um, the speaker will be Anja Lambrecht at London Business School. Same place, same time. Looking forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.